In this lecture, we're going to be looking at media representations of disability. So to do that, we're going to be looking at what we mean by disability and the different definitions of disability, the biomedical as well as the social. We'll be looking at disabilism and how this is shown in the media, as well as the stereotypes that are shown in the media and the theories behind why it is the way that it is. So let's start by talking about what we mean by disability. Now, it's not a term that is very easily defined and people who are disabled will have their own views on which sort of definition they want to use. But if we look at the De Equality Act of 2010, it says that somebody is disabled if they have a physical or mental impairment, which has a substantial and long term adverse effect on their ability to do normal day to day activities. So this could be a physical act, a disability such as an amputation or um, some sort of um, physical uh, being in a wheelchair, something like that. Or it could be something that's more of a hidden disability, such as autism or a mental health issue, um, things like that. So it's quite a broad definition that's given by the Equalities Act. And the act itself does go into more detail on what would be considered as a disability compared to what is not. Um, and you can read that if you wish. That is completely up to you. But it does go to show that there is a social construction of disability. And there are two key models of um, this social construction. The first being the biomedical mo model, which um, describes a disability as a physical or mental impairment that they need caring for and where somebody is dependent upon an able bodied person. Whereas the social model or disabilism looks at people who are disabled by society through prejudice and discrimination, which reinforces the belief that they are dependent upon the able bodied. There are many, many disabled people who live independent lives with, who do not require a carer to look after them, yet they are still considered disabled. It's often required, uh, looked at sorry, and seen as the biomedical model is seen as the deficit model. Somebody who is disabled is in deficit of something. They are unable to do something or live a certain way or meet the basics, basic understanding of normality within society. Whereas the social model looks at how society marginalizes and ostracizes those who are different rather than looking at what's wrong with the person they're looking at what's wrong with society so under this definition for example being autistic uh, the biomedical model i would not be considered disabled however the social model would see me as disabled now legally autism is a disability and it's a weird one that i'm still trying to get my head around but it is showing that disability is socially constructed. It's being able to meet the needs, uh, the, the norms and of society in terms of behavior or the values in terms of expectations. So how do does the media represent disability? Well, first of all, as we've talked about re previously, there is symbolic annihilation where we have able-bodied actors playing disabled characters. Tom Cruise in Born in the Fourth of July was in a wheelchair. Um, Dustin Hoffman played an autistic character. There are a number of characters who play deaf or blind characters. And rather than using actors and actresses who have these disabilities, the media will use somebody who doesn't and get them to behave in a way that they have a particular disability. Um, they also show dis disabled people in a deficit model. They tend to show disabled people as not being able to do things. There's a film called I Am Sam, which is um, Sean Penn playing a developmentally challenged 
man who gets dumped with a daughter uh, as a baby and looks at how he then raises his child and it's looking at it's a very uplifting film um but at the end it, it, throughout the film they're just kind of going you can't do this he go and he he is he he's a father he is raising this child so when we see disabled people in the media particularly in film and television it's usually showing them in a way that is what about more about what they can't do rather than what they can do or just living a normal everyday life which brings us on to that last part of symbolic annihilation which is the one-dimensional characterization disabled people are in when they're in the media they are disabled that's their thing that's the, that's the whole character similar to um lgbtq ai plus characters where that's their whole thing and we'll look at that more in the sexuality lecture but there is this idea that they are everything about them their master status is their disability not giving them that wider range of characterization to show that they are just people we also have tokenism and sancho put this as the wheelchair as an icon let's show that we are diverse let's stick somebody in here who has a has a disability and make their character all about their disability um put somebody in a wheelchair shows that we're diverse similar to what we saw with ethnicity and um, media representation but overall there is an underrepresentation of disability in the media it's estimated that one in four adults and uh, sorry one in four adults and one in 20 children are covered by the disability discrimination act that's a lot of people sorry about the typo um but you don't see that representation in the media you see able-bodied beautiful people doing what they do but there isn't an equality or an equity of disability within the media so let's look at some of the stereotypes that we see when we see disability in the movies and in television we'll deal with news a bit later so the first one is as being pathetic you've got shows like the undateables where again these people are in the show because they have some form of disability and but they want to date they want to ha have relationships but find it difficult to to find people because of their disability so they're kind of putting these people out there as pathetic as incapable of doing these normal things the kind of oh bless element of disability or they're an object of curiosity um the picture i've got on the screen is of the elephant man um but you also see it with wanda and with um people particularly with physical disabilities being considered something of a curiosity um something to ask questions about the third is sinister or evil and you see this a lot in bond films now the, i've got um dr uh, evil from austin powers on the screen with mini me um who are considered who uh, both have disabilities um dr no doc, sorry dr evil was in the wheelchair mini me having dwarfism they um were evil because of this many of the bond villains have some sort of disability be it physical or mental we often see serial killers being um, portrayed in the media as in film particularly fictional serial killers not real life ones as having some sort of mental illness or mental disability but then you also get the super cripple um where you have people with disabilities who are achieving amazing things now my example is echo and daredevil echo is deaf and an amputee daredevil is blind yeah they're superheroes 
But a more real life example would be the way that they portray the Paralympians. And it's kind of like, look at what these guys are achieving despite their disability. I mean, so these guys are hardcore athletes and they are portrayed as kind. It's still that kind of, aren't they amazing? They've overcome their disabilities to be able to do these things. You then get the establishment of atmosphere. Now, my example here is American Horror Story and a freak show where the the horror of their disabilities has created this circus act and there's more horror and it's all horrific, horrible things that are going on. Obviously, American Horror Story is that kind of show anyway, depending on which season you're watching, but they're using the disabilities to really push the atmosphere in Freak Show. You then got the laughable um, disabilities where uh, the example here is from Little Britain. It's an awful show um, where you had one of the uh, comedians in a wheelchair and the other being his, his um, carer. And it would be this kind of situational comedy where the character in the wheelchair would only use the words I know uh, or that one and then at some point in the sketch would get up and run around even though it's supposed to be in a wheelchair um, and it was you, the disability was used for comedy effect you've then got your own worst enemy so this is the idea that disabled people um, are their own worst enemies. Now, there is a lot of comorbidity between disabilities and addictions and uh, mental health problems, but this kind of portrayal puts it out as like, well, they're doing this to themselves. The example I've got here is Jessica Jones, who, is, who has PTSD, um, and because of that, she has alcohol issues, she is hypersexual, um, and let's face it, a bit of a bitch, but she is her own worst enemy. She's portrayed as she doesn't have to be this way, but she is because she's not doing anything to help herself. Next, we have the burden. So this is where the disabled person is portrayed as a burden upon the carers. They are requiring more of the able bodied and are not able to give back. My example here is, um, oh God, what's the name of the film? Um, you Before Me, where um, she, the, the girl is hired to look after the guy in the wheelchair, who's also his own worst enemy because he's quite narky at the beginning. Um, but we see this regularly within um, the media where it's, Again, that biomedical model of these people can't look after themselves. They have to be looked after by others. And that is a burden upon their family. We then get non-sexual, where very rarely do we see um, disabled people engaging in normal, healthy relationships. The example I've got here is Bran Stark from um, Game of Thrones. I think he's the only one of the very few characters in the entire film that doesn't have a sex scene. Um, not film, series, sorry. Um, but his in, the, the in Game of Thrones is a very sexual TV show. And yet it's never even considered for Bran once he's in the wheelchair. Now, obviously, he that without spoiling anything, he goes on to do other things. But his sexuality is completely repressed. And we see that often within the media where people who are disabled aren't given characters or storylines where they are involved in normal healthy relationships and then finally we've got the unable to participate in normal life and this is a really bad thing for them the example here is million dollar baby now the majority of this film is looking at hillary swank's character um, becoming a female boxer but it's the, the way the film is is set up is it's her telling her story from a hospital bed after an accident where she is paralysed from the neck down and her wanting to end her life. 
So we have this idea that they're not able to participate in normal life and this is depressing and they don't want to be part of everyday life. Now, Agyeman, Agyeman, I have no idea, um, A-G-Y-E-M-A-N, have no idea, um, says that when we look at media representations of disability, particularly in TV and movies, it is very rare for disability to be portrayed as a normal, everyday, incidental phenomena, where the characterization of the person is just, this is who they are, they happen to be disabled. It's more a case of, this is the character, you are disabled. Okay, so it is hard for disabled people to see themselves represented in an accurate way in TV and movies. So we get this work from uh, Tom Shakespeare, who does a lot of work on media representation of disability. And he regards the representation of disabled people as dustbins for disavowal, disavowal even, where society tries to ignore the disabled in any in a way to try and deny their very existence. So that symbolic annihilation and underrepresentation of um, disabled people tends to be as a way of let's pretend they don't exist. Let's pretend they're not there because it makes us uncomfortable. He says that media stereotypes of the disabled are crude, one dimensional and simplistic. Again, not showing the disabled people as uh, the disability as being incidental as their entire character is based on their disability. They are there because of their disability. And the use of disability as a character trait, plot device or atmosphere is a shortcut. Such stereotypes reinforce negative attitudes to, towards disabled people and ignorance about the nature of dis disability. So it's putting people, putting the disabled person forward in a very negative light, in, in that kind of, they are non-sexual, they are a burden upon their carers they don't show the true experience of disabled people within the media um which again brings us back to this rare portrayal of disabled people as someone who is a normal person who happens to have an impairment that impairment becomes the central point of the character rather than the incidental side of it. Now we could we are we can say that there are um, movements away from this, and there are characters. Uh, we are now seeing disabled characters in a less um, stereotypical kind of way. With um, Echo, for example, yes, she was an amputee and she was deaf, but it wasn't the central arc of her story. It just was part of who she was. Um, it did have some plot devices, um, but rarely was it was it was mostly a case of she just so happens to be deaf and an amputee. Now, I, I read somewhere that in that particular case with the amputation, they did build that into her storyline with the car accident because the character in the comic books was not an amputee. But the actress was so they didn't want to sidestep the fact that she had she was an amputee they built that into her narrative and into her background um there was also the char uh, character in um good omens season two there was one of the angels who was in a wheelchair but it was never a kind of brought up that she was in a wheelchair she just so happened to be an angel who was in a wheelchair Okay. Now, if we look at media representation in the news, um, Williams Findlay did a content analysis of two UK broadsheets, The Times and The Independent, to see how representation had changed over time. And he looked at, I think it was about 10 years worth of newspapers. And what he found was that there was a decline in use of stereotypical terminology, and particularly in... Um, 
what would now be considered inappropriate terminology referring to disabled people. However, journalists still assume that the life of a disabled person is tragic or they are afflicted. So it's still being portrayed as something to be pitied, something to be um, feel sorry for the disabled person about. But in general, what he found was disabled people are not newsworthy unless they are a victim or a perpetrator. So of a crime particularly, or, or um, in particular, sort of like, um, there was a story last year of a man who um, murdered his wife and daughter and then committed suicide. Um, and it was when it was in the media, it was um, father had um, with depression, murders wife and child. And we could link this into here into gender here, where this story particularly, the this, the wife was the head teacher of a very prestigious private school, and it was portrayed that her success caused his depression. So we don't again don't see that normalization of disability within the news. Now, Watson, Philo and Bryant did a similar study um, in 2010, 2011 and 2004, 2005. But instead of looking at um, broadsheets, they looked at tabloids. So things like The Sun, The Daily Mail and various other tabloid newspapers. And what they found was that there was in tabloid newspapers, there was an increase in reporting on disability. So there were more stories incorporated about disability or including people of disabilities. However, they portrayed disabled people as welfare scroungers and underserving of benefits. And then there was an increase in derogatory language. So whereas the broadsheet newspapers are almost um, ignoring disability, the tabloid newspapers see them as a scapegoat. Disabled people who are getting benefits don't deserve them. They're a sponge on society. They are not worthy of these benefits. And with this comes that rise in derogatory language and misunderstanding of disability. Now, if we move on to look at representations of mental disability, what we see with, from the, glue, uh, start again, the Glasgow University Media Group, in particular Philo in 1999, did, again did a content analysis to see how media representation of disability, of mental disability was shown. And in general, the when it comes to mental disability, it's focusing on violent incidents. And again, a high proportion of able-bodied people feeling fear and anxiety within proximity of those with mental health problems. So we've got the example here of the two jokers. We've got the joke in Phoenix and um, Heath Ledger, where they are psychotic. <laughs> um, but then you've got um, Carrie from um, Homeland, who has bipolar disorder, or maybe schizophrenia, I can't remember, um, who is seen as unstable and difficult to be around and over dramatic. And finally, you've got Carrie. Now, whether or not you th believe Carrie to have a disability, it's not really very clear in the Stephen King novel or in any of the films, but she is, well, she destroys an entire town. I'm, I'm, it's not really um, spoilers when the book's been out since longer than I've been alive. But she is bullied and picked on. It's possible that there is some learning developmental difficulties and she burns down her entire town. So when we see mental disabilities in the media, it tends to be linked to violence and to um, fear and anxiety from those who do not have a mental disability. OK, or it's completely ignored. Now, telethons. Now, this isn't something we really have much of today, but they are um, a televised event. I think kind of like Red Nose Day, um, Children in Need, things like that, which are obviously focusing on children rather than disabilities. I think Red Nose Day does a little bit on disabilities as well. 
Um, but they're a televised event to raise money for charity for, with uh, entertainment, donations, broadcast live, lots of celebrities, lots of performances, um, trying to get lots of people involved and raise mon money for various courses, medical research, disaster relief, social services, children, uh, famine. Band-Aid was a massive telethon. It was one of the biggest that there's ever been to help with um, support for the famine in Africa in the 1980s. But when we look at this in relation to disabled people, Roper pointed out that they actually can create more problems for the disabled than they solve. Yes, they're raising thousands and millions and millions of pounds or dollars for charities and for um, support and research and things like that. But it implies that governments are not responsible for providing for the disabled, that it is the responsibility of society to provide for the disabled which allows governments to then reduce fundings. Um, one of the big things at the moment is the reduced funding for special educational needs in schools with, a non, with an increasing number of children being diagnosed with an educational need. The funding is not matching up. And these telethons are creating this idea, well, it's not our responsibility, it's yours. Um, but they also give, provide the public with this system of guilt alleviation where they can kind of go, well, I've given money to Red Nose Day. I've given money to this. I've given money to that. So therefore, I've done my bit without actually learning or understanding the experience of the disabled. This was then backed up by or also noted by CARF in 1988, where um, the telethons act to keep audiences givers, whereas the recipients are meant to be grateful, where those who are disabled are supposed to act in a way that is humble. Oh, thank you so much for supporting us kind of thing. And they're more about entertainment than information. They're not there to show disabled people in their reality. They're not there to educate people about different disabilities. In fact, what they're doing is entertaining people with charity, with um, entertainment personalities, performances from pop stars and musicians, um, special episodes of uh, popular TV shows, things like that are for entertainment. They're not about informing and therefore it confirms prejudices such as that these people, the disabled people, are dependent upon the able-bodied. They are a burden on their families, on society. Um, and this is not education. It is reinforcing those um, stereotypes of the disabled. So what do the disabled think about their media representation? Ross in 1996 studied and interviewed 384 disabled viewers attitudes towards how the media presents them and overwhelmingly these disabled attitude uh, disabled people were very critical of media representation of the disabled and in particular they dis uh, they objected to seven key areas the infantile infantilization of disabled characters so seeing them babied and um, molly coddled rather than active members of society. They said that much of the representation is unrealistic and sanitized portrayal of disability. It's not realistic. It's not showing some of the difficulties that disabled people have in everyday life, such as using public transport, um, going to the toilet in public, um, being able to go into coffee shops and things like that. Some of those coffee shops have very tightly packed tables. Somebody in a wheelchair may not be able to access that. The um, sensory overload from being out in public, things like that. The persistent use of wheelchairs, white sticks and guide dogs to denote disability. There are many, many, many hidden disabilities which are not represented in the media because you can't obviously see it 
or obviously show it in the media unless it is a severe form um again i go back to autism there are many many people who are autistic and to look at them you wouldn't know that they were autistic so when they show autism in the media it tends to be the more severe non-verbal non-communication type of autism rather than the majority of autistic people who live very normal everyday lives associations with disabled roles such as anger and bitterness people who are perhaps become disabled at different at various points in their life are then portrayed as being bitter or angry about their disability um obviously i'm not saying that they should be celebrating their disability but they're not showing them the real realistic view of it where you get on with it you get on with life the restricted repertoire of characters generally being the sidekick very rarely do you see them as the main character although this is changing however when you see a disabled person in a main character role it's usually all about their disability um, and this can be caused by lack of first-hand experience by media practitioners there aren't that many disabled people in the creative side of the media and this can also lead to failure to present disabled people as having a normal everyday life that they are doing the same things that everybody else is they go and do their shopping they do their housework they go to school they go to university but there is this failure to show them as just being like everybody else and living their lives like everybody else so why is this so what is it that sociologists believe has led to this representation so the first is the pluralists and they believe that as we've said before media representations are a reflection of the dominant view in society and in this case the dominant view is that disability is dysfunctional for the individual and for society its representations are mirroring the social anxieties around impairment the fear that people have about being caught being or a i don't know what the word is being labeled as disabled and representations reflect the courage shown by disabled individuals particularly if they're young and it portrays the reality for carers and individuals but that is because that is what society wants to see and because the majority of society is able-bodied it has that able-bodied lens on me on the representation in the media however the social constructionists argue that impaired individu individuals are disabled by society and the mass media so this disability this inability to live an everyday normal life is perpetrated and put forward by the media and by society because that is what they see disability as being an inability to do something media professionals have a view of disability which is constantly reinforced in the media unfortunate dependent burdens um, pitiful all of these are um, what the able-bodied society considers when they see disabled um, and it's all about what a non-disabled person an able-bodied person would dread the tragedy the loss the unknown the difficulties the changes to their lifestyle that they would have to make but the disabled are rarely consulted by journalists by media professionals to get that ref that realistic portrayal of what it is to be disabled reinforcing that social construction of the biomedical model of disability and then finally you've got the postmodernist view and they argue that the medical viewpoint is in decline as our understanding of health and the able-bodied is changing and we are seeing more represent positive representations in the media in sport in as i said previously there are characterized characters in tv shows who are disabled but that's not their master status of their character it's a oh you just so happen to be disabled 
but we can't make generalizations because different TV stations, different media groups will represent disability differently, according to Gauntlet, with the pluralist idea of there being so many channels and creators and companies out there now that if we don't like a particular representation of disability, we will just turn over or turn off or read something else. So media representation of disability, we can argue, is very stereotypical and very much a deficit model of disability, but things are changing for the better.